Today we're going to discuss how to write a scene. So the first thing to realize is that a scene is just a unit of drama, just like a sequence or an act or a story overall. And so in that sense, it's going to follow the same rules of drama that we would, we would use in any other unit of drama. So the first thing we need to do when writing a scene is define those dramatic units or those dramatic elements that are going to keep the audience's interest and pull them forward through the scene. So the first question is, uh, who wants what? Who in the scene is looking to accomplish what? And the important thing here is that desires can be aspirational or they can be about avoiding something. So in the movie Goodwill Hunting, for instance, instance uh, in that movie, a lot of the time, Will is just looking to avoid confronting his past. So a lot of what he does is about trying to keep people out and keeping his distance and putting up that guard. So that can be a strong desire for a character. So in a scene, you'll likely want to have two characters who want opposing things. Because if you have two characters who want the same thing and there's no opposition in, in the scene, it's most likely going to just lay there and be pretty boring. So that's why we generally want to have at least two characters who have conflicting desires. And this is why it's important to define what a character wants. Hey, Very Bad Writing, thanks for joining. Chronicle, hello. Earth, to Omar, hello. Thanks everybody who just joined. Uh, we're discussing today how to write a scene. If you have any questions, please leave them below and thank you so much for being here. So we've got uh, the desire defined for the character in our scene or the multiple characters. And then just like any other dramatic unit, the next thing we wanna do is uh, define what the conflict is gonna be. So the conflict can be another character, which is that scenario where you would have at least two characters who want opposing things. But it could also be something external, right? Uh, an external desire isn't necessarily the most emotionally impactful. It becomes more emotionally impactful when it affects a character internally. So when it strikes at some fear they have or some insecurity or some weakness, if it really cuts down and they feel bad about it, then external conflict can be interesting too. Uh, there's also internal conflict which is where a character has two desires that are opposed within themselves. So there was this great example in uh, the movie, or the TV show, Das Boot, where this woman uh, is looking to interrogate somebody else, and the person she's interrogating knows a secret, and she knows she knows a secret, so she doesn't actually want to be successful in the interrogation but also she's trying to do her duty, so she wants to make the bosses happy. So she's got this conflicting desire about what to do in the scene, and that creates great inner conflict, and it creates a great uh, opposition. Alicia, or Elise, thanks for joining. Eliane, hello. Diego, thanks so much for being here. Uh, if anybody has any questions about their writing or storytelling, please leave it below. Today we are discussing how to write a scene. So we've got who wants what, uh, we've got our opposition, which gives rise to conflict, and then as with any other dramatic unit, we've got to define our stakes. What does the protagonist of the scene, what will they win if they get their desire, and what will they lose if they fail to get their desire? It's also important to realize here that the protagonist of the scene may not necessarily be the protagonist of the story. So protagonist from a dramatic sense, in a dramatic sense, means the person who wants something, the or the character who has a desire. So in that sense, we've got to define who the protagonist is, what they want, uh, who their opponent is, or what their opponent is, and then additionally, what's at stake? What are they risking? What do they stand to lose if things don't go well? Then the final ingredient of drama, as we have to define in our overall story, so we have to define in the scene, is urgency. Why does this scene need to be completed sooner rather than later? Why does the uh, protagonist of the scene need to accomplish their desire now rather than later? If it's a character who's getting on a bus or a, you know, a bus or a train or something and they're leaving town, well, maybe the protagonist has to find them before they leave. Like that adds some urgency to the situation. Now in Matt Bird's book, uh, The Secrets of Story, he also talks about little mini timers or mini ticking clocks that we can put in a scene that create a sort of subconscious 
urgency, where there's no, not necessarily any explicit urgency, but maybe if a character starts a toaster, then we'll implicitly know that by the time that the bread is ready, you know, the scene has to be done. But you can also add some sort of almost artificial urgency to the scene too, like one character has to leave for a meeting. And so they have a conversation, but one character is always trying to leave, like, I'm really gonna be late, you gotta hurry it up, you gotta get going. And so that pushes forward the drama because the desires have to be completed sooner rather than later. Uh, Charlie, thanks for joining. Harper, hello. Ghostface, thanks for joining. Today we're discussing how to write a scene. So we've got our four elements of drama. We've got desire, we've got opposition, which gives rise to conflict. We've got stakes and we've got urgency. So these are the four, uh, the four basic things we're gonna want for drama. But the other thing we're gonna wanna define is what is the essential thing that's going to create narrative drive in the scene? The thing that's going to hook the audience and keep them interested. And there are four basic tools for creating narrative drive in a scene. The first is the dramatic question or dramatic tension. This is what we're all most familiar with. And this is kind of what I've been implicitly assuming that the scene's gonna be, where a character wants something and then they come across opposition and then there's a question about whether they'll get it. That creates dramatic tension. But that's not the only way to keep the audience's interest. Another really powerful way is to have dramatic irony, where the audience knows something that a character doesn't. And so the audience wants to stick around and find out when the character will learn that information. Eliana says, love to listen more, but it's so late here now. Thank you for joining, really appreciate it. Uh, definitely go get some sleep. Uh, thanks for being here. So, yeah, yeah, that's, that's something else, dramatic irony. And there was this great scene in The Office, I think it was season eight or nine, where Robert California comes in to, and he knocks on Andy's office and he says, in a minute, my wife is gonna come in here and she's going, I promised her that I would give her a job. Under no circumstances can that be allowed to happen. You, Andy, cannot offer her a job. And uh, it was just such a great setup for a scene because now we've got this opposition automatically, right? <laughs> where the wife wants the job, Robert California does not want to give her the job, Andy does not want to give her the job because Robert California, his boss, doesn't want him uh, to give her the job. But then Robert California on the surface is going to be arguing that she should have the job. And so it's great too because it creates this dramatic irony where the audience is like, when is this gonna all, when's this facade gonna fall apart? When are we going to find out that, uh, <laughs> when's the wife gonna find out essentially that they're trying to sabotage her job opportunity here? It was just a great little scene setup. It's got that opposition and dramatic irony. And that's an example where you can combine dramatic um, tension with dramatic irony. Katie, thanks for joining. Sepid, hello. Thanks for being here. And if any of you all have any questions about a scene you're writing or the story that you're telling or you just want to discuss uh, something that's challenging you, please leave a question below. Appreciate it. We're discussing how to write a scene. So we've got our dramatic, we've got our narrative drive, we've got who wants what, we've got what's at stake, we've got urgency, we've got opposition. Now, one question we can ask is whether our scene is going to fundamentally be a chase or an escape. We can generally think of all scenes as being either a chase or an escape in the sense that a character wants something to attain something, it's aspirational, or they're looking to avoid. And I mentioned this briefly before, so chase is aspiring towards something, uh, escape is avoiding something. So we may wanna decide, is the desire fundamentally chase or escape? That can be an interesting uh, line to define. Then the next thing we wanna do is, is there some way for us to make the character's desire hard to want to do? In the words of Matt Bird, this is compelling conflict because conflict is interesting. Desire is interesting when it's hard to do when there's some obstacle, that's an obstacle, but it's even more interesting when it's hard to want to do. So for an instance, for instance, if a character has bad news that they need to deliver to someone, they have the desire to deliver the information because it's their duty, 
but then they don't want to hurt this person by delivering this bad news. And so they've got this conflicting desire. I have to do my duty. I don't want to hurt the person. So it's going to be, it's going to be rough. It's going to be a tough situation. And that makes for a compelling scene. But there are several different ways that we can make a desire hard to want to do. A couple more examples are if a character needs to confront their fear in order to do something they want to do, that's hard to do. So, you know, make sure you've clearly defined what your character's fears are and try to force them to confront those fears throughout the scenes and the story in general. Another thing to do can be to go against their moral code. Maybe they want to save someone's life, for instance, but it, it, the thing that they have to do to save the person's life goes against their morality. That's tough. That's, that's a rough thing to do. Another thing to do can be they have to fulfill their duty to someone or to some institution and the desire goes against what their duty is. That was the example that I gave earlier with Das Boot, where she wants to keep the secret, but she also wants to interrogate. And so these desires are opposed and that makes it hard to want to do. What we're essentially talking about here is it creates inner conflict in the character. So that's an important thing. Ghostface says, sort of how the beginning of my anthology starts. As soon as it gets good, I'll start my other stories, giving it like a Twilight Zone vibe. Nice. Um, exactly, I'm five starting it. Starting on FO4, my narrator's story. I don't know that abbreviation. I may not just, or maybe for my, for my narrator's story. Okay. I might just not be hip there. Uh, interesting. That's great. Hub says, what about Catcher in the Rye, where the protagonist wanders aimlessly and uh, we hear his thoughts? Okay. Great point in that not all stories need to be driven by dramatic tension or dramatic irony or the fourth, uh, the third tool is promises and promises can be broken down into either telegraphing or dangling causes. And I've done a couple of posts on that, but we can go into that if anybody has any questions. And so those aren't the only things that generate dramatic interest though, or narrative drive. Now those are the most powerful and especially if you're doing a screenplay, for instance, and you don't have all the length of a book, uh, a book where you can take your time uh, and you need to catch the audience's attention in a matter of seconds rather than, you know, most likely if someone's got your book and you've done well word of mouth wise, you got, I don't know, 10 pages or so, you're, a couple pages. <laughs> Maybe if they pick it up at the library or the bookstore, you only have a couple seconds. Um, but there are other ways to capture the audience's attention. And so I think, for instance, in The Catcher of the Rye, like you were saying, wandering around aimlessly, not really with a clear goal necessarily. Some things you can do is have an interesting world, if it's a fantasy or sci-fi in particular. If we see things that are odd in the world, that catches our attention and makes us want to continue. Uh, showing a character who is unique and particularly unique relationships. Anytime we have this combination of things that are familiar and also unique, it can catch our attention and make us want to continue. There's also dramatic uh, intrigue, so any images that are interesting, uh, subtext, the Kuleshov effect. Actually, in the book that I'm writing, I'm creating this gigantic list of all of the different techniques you can use to keep the audience's attention. and. It's pretty large, so it's a it's a massive compendium for a list. It's great. Uh, some other things are uh, intriguing the audience's imagination, like leaving a piece out, creating a puzzle. That obviously goes to mysteries and suspense. So yeah, there are a bunch of other techniques, not just dramatic tension, dramatic irony, and promises. Although I would say that from a drama perspective, those are the most powerful. So great question. Uh, Hop says, never mind, you just answer my question. Uh, internal conflict, yeah, and character building. Nice, exactly. An internal conflict is a sort of form of dramatic tension because it, it, a character has a desire, but instead of the opponent being someone else, it's themselves. And so from that perspective, you could say that internal conflict is dramatic tension. And you can even create suspense when a character has internal conflict because we don't know which of the desires they're going to choose. And when we see them take action toward one and then action toward another, that creates this uncertainty, especially if we combine that with urgency, we get suspense and high stakes, of course. 
So that's pretty interesting. Ghostface says, uh, yeah, mine takes place in 2036, but then gets a little interesting when the main characters start dealing with time travel and cult. Ooh, that's rough. Uh, <laughs> no, I love uh, that you're sharing your book. I really appreciate it. And anybody else who wants to share the stories that they're, they're doing, uh, it's great. The, you know, the more you can share, the more you can potentially find people who are interested in that same story idea, that same subject, and um, we can potentially get some brainstorming going on. So I think it's great to share, and I appreciate it. So let me continue with writing a scene, some of the things that we want to do. Uh, we've defined uh, the elements of our dramatic situation, right? Uh, so the other thing we want to decide is what's the character's motivation? They have a desire in this scene, but why? What is it that's pushing them to accomplish this desire? It's an interesting thing that desire is hierarchical. So if I have a desire to, I'm hungry, so I have a desire to eat. Then I create a plan, which is to go make a sandwich. The desire to make a sandwich is a subset of the desire to become not hungry anymore. I go to the fridge, I look, I don't have any sandwiches, I don't have any sandwich material, so I create a new plan to go to the store. The store is a subset of the desire to get a sandwich, which is a subset of the desire to uh, become not hungry, be full. So it's important to realize that a motivation is sort of the next desire higher on the hierarchical list of desires for a character. A character might have a desire to please their father, for instance, and so the thing that they're doing in the scene is really about pleasing their father. So that could be... Uh, th that's good to define what a character's motivation can be. Frank says, we could argue that Holden's goal is to return uh, home both externally and internally, although there is no scene breaks or the cut and thrust technique. At least it's very subtle, I think. Yeah, and it can be totally subtle, right? That's interesting. Um, good, good example. Yeah, I like that. Kogan, thanks for joining. Appreciate it. And anybody who just joined, if you have any questions about your story or writing, please leave it below. We're discussing how to write a scene. Carol Ann, thank you for joining as well. So the next thing we want to do is define what's the fundamental relationship between the characters in the scene. Scenes can be made so much more interesting when we have some preset relationship between the characters. When you have two characters who are conflicting, who have opposing desires, it's more interesting when they're mother and daughter or when they're, uh, you know, ex-boyfriend and, uh, and protagonist. And when you have that, it become there's this subtext that's created to the scene because you're carrying all this additional baggage of the relationship that you can really exploit. So when you're coming up with scene ideas, potentially see if you can uh, force two characters who have an existing relationship into the same scene and put their desires in conflict. Okay, the next thing is strategy and tactics. So important. This goes into a plan. So a character has a desire. They're going to lose something if they don't get it. There's urgency. They have this opposition. So how are they going to get it? This is, you could think of this as the fifth element of creating a dramatic situation, which is uh, what's the character willing to do? Now, it's been said that every scene is either a fight, a seduction, or a negotiation. We can think of that we can also redefine that and say that those are about the tactics used to get what a character wants. And so we can say that every scene is either persuasion, manipulation, and deception, or coercion. So persuasion is voluntary. If a character decides to convince someone to do something, or asks for a favor, or uh, uses their charm, just logics the situation out, makes a deal, that's all voluntary. And so that's persuasion. Then there's manipulation and deception, which is about creating a false reality. It's about giving half information, uh, misleading information, sleight of hand. It's immoral, You one would say in most cases. And so not all characters are going to be willing to jump into the category of immorality. But as is, also think about where your scene is in the story because a character will act dif act differently 
in the scene, depending on where that scene falls in the story, and specifically where they fall within their character arc. Because toward the latter half of the story, a character may find themselves falling to immorality. It's called moral decay, or the paradox of animosity, where through the, through the journey of them battling this opponent or this antagonist, they find themselves stooping lower and lower in their immorality or their morality. They think, you know, if I'm ever going to defeat this guy, I got to fight fire with fire. I got to adopt some of their evil tactics. I got to start manipulating. I got to start deceiving because that's the only way to beat this villain. And that can be the case in a scene. So consider where the scene falls within the character's arc. So that's manipulation and deception. But then after that, we've got coercion. And coercion is just violence, essentially, or threats. It's and it doesn't have to be overt. It could be an implicit threat that's understood by both parties. Uh, it's just where a character implies violence if things don't go their way, or a force, rather. So those are kind of the three tactics, the three main tactics. Now, there are a bunch of different sub-tactics that fall within those three categories. Uh, for instance, like creating a Trojan horse, um, using a dead man switch, all these sort of strategies that we can also read from the uh, the art of war uh, a lot of robert green's books with the goodness he has one about strategy and war a lot especially if you're doing an action story a lot of that is about about what tactics the characters are willing to use and how the protagonist and the opponent are changing their tactics as the other one kind of one-ups them. It's a big part of action, particularly in Die Hard. If you haven't seen that recently, that is a great example of two characters dueling. And so consider what the characters are going to do in the scene as far as tactics go. What's their plan to get what they want? Very, very important. Because once we have all of those elements, we can then start watching the characters just play out their plans. So we just set the characters loose. Well, this guy intends to do this because they want this. And this other person intends to do this because they want that. And those, assuming we've set up their desires to be in opposition, then they're going to start battling. And they're going to have to start improvising once those plans come into conflict with each other. Frank says, do you recommend scene breaks and intertwine them to create a sort of pulp fiction effect? And how does a motivation reaction work? A motivation reaction unit. Uh, is that what you were mentioning? Yeah, motivation reaction unit. Um, so I was reading about that on, I think K.M. Weiland's blog has that and then a couple of others as well. I th that's from the book um, GMC, I think. So you may have to remind me on exactly what that is, because I know all the storytellers have different terminology for everything, but I believe that's part of the reaction cycle to a disruption. You have to correct me if, I'm, if I misunderstand that term. So if something happens to a character, then there's a reaction cycle that they have. And the reaction cycle is first physiological, then it's emotional, then it's logical and analytical, then they make a decision, and then they enact it through a plan. And uh, different characters go through different parts of the reaction cycle in different amounts, right? Like you might have a detective who will go through an emotional reaction, but it'll be so subtle and so short that we may not realize it. Uh, additionally, you could have a character who spends most of their time on the emotional reaction and just barely skips over the analytical part before they jump right to a decision. So you can have different characters who spend different times in the reaction cycle. And then additionally, uh, it depends what your genre is too, right? If it's mystery, we will want to see a character spend more time in the analytical range of that cycle versus if it's romance, we may want more time in the emotional reaction. So regardless of character, because that's what the reader wants from that genre, that's what they're most interested in seeing. As far as scene breaks, um, you don't have to be, you don't have to be explicit with it. If we wanted to define a scene, and this is 
this is a good opportunity to go into this. What is a scene? And specifically, there's a difference between a scene and a sequel. A sequel is also sometimes called an interlude. And an interlude, and this may be what you're talking about with motivation reaction cycle two, or unit rather, where uh, a character has something happened to the character. Then we need to take some time to see the reaction to that thing. So there's a scene or a situation where characters are talking or where characters reflecting, but nothing's really happening. We're just taking the time to appreciate the magnitude of the previous scene. We're taking the time to think over what just happened, let it sink into the characters' minds, let it sink into the audience's minds, and those are called sequels or interludes. And they're important because in life, we think about the re we take time to let all of the craziness sink in and that's important for the reader and for the characters it makes it uh so that we become more connected with the characters in an emotional sense you know if rambo shoots up some building or something it may be interesting to see a scene afterward where he thinks about the fact that he just killed all of these family men and that all of these families are going to be devastated like that would make it more interesting i think because then you've created internal conflict in there too he feels bad about what he just did now sometimes action stories don't explore that but it can be totally worth it it's a great a great addition to have after a scene especially one that's been full of disruptions and revelations and action so what is a scene a scene is different than a sequel a scene is a situation where there is a turning point and a turning point is where, as Robert McKee says, or Sean Coyne says, a story value changes from one thing to another. We go from hope to despair. We go from fear to strength. We go from, uh, it, and it doesn't have to be just negative polarity to positive or vice versa. It can also be that a character goes from just having an okay day, having a pretty good day to winning the lottery and just being tremendously excited or vice versa just being a little bummed to being devastated so you can you can change the magnitude not just the polarity but in that way we can define scenes by these turning points these disruptions these changes to the character's life and so we can also define scenes in a lot of ways based on what a character wants their desire and then the disruption is often the answer to that desire. Do they get the thing that they want or do they fail to get the thing that they want and something completely different happens? And so scene breaks can be, you know, if you're not doing a, scene, a screenplay, particularly where you don't have those uh, explicit scene breaks, the turning points can denote the change in a scene. Uh, you'll have some resolution after the disruption of the turning point. But then what those disruptions do is they often give rise to a new desire in the character. So a character is going about their day, they're having a pretty good day, they win the lottery. Boom! New desire. Completely new desire. Maybe before they had a desire to get a sandwich, now they want to buy sandwiches for everybody in the store and go pick up their money. Uh, when they go down the, to get their money, they find out it was a prank or somebody had been fooling them uh, but on the way to get their money they put down you know they took out several credit cards and bought I don't know a Lamborghini or something uh, but then they go and they find out another disruption they didn't actually win the lottery now they are bummed again but each one of these disruptions is going to give rise to a new desire so there's no i wouldn't say it's a very clean delineation when you're looking at it that way but that is one way to look at when scenes and when they start based on when desires are answered or or unanswered or answered uh, negatively rather and additionally where the turning points or disruptions happen frank that was a very long answer i hope that helped and i'll scroll down a bit uh the writer quarter thank you for being here courtney hello stella thanks so much anna wow thanks everybody for being here uh if you have any questions about your story or writing in general please leave it below today we're discussing how to write a scene uh, and Frank, let me know if the motivation reaction unit was what you were thinking. I'll go look that up in my notes because I know I've taken notes about that. It's just something I haven't read about in a while. Um, 
Oh, actually, Frank says, terminology is a problem. That's why I'm confused. I thought the motivation reaction unit and SQL were kind of the same. So an emotional cycle is key. Thanks a lot for this. Absolutely. Um, now, I'm not exactly sure if that's what they mean by the motivation reaction unit. And I'll go, like I said, I'll go look that up. Um, if I remember, I'll DM you. Uh, but that's, yeah, the sequels definitely. And then that, that reaction cycle is a huge part of it. And then we can also think of the scene and the sequel being one sort of circle. Uh, K.M. Wyland has some great stuff on this as far as that's concerned. And I like to think of them as a whole disruption too, where a character wants something and then something happens that disrupts their life. That's a turning point. And then uh, they, have, they go through that emotional reaction cycle. They make a decision, they come up with a plan, and then they enact that new desire. And that kind of brings us full circle. Uh, and in between where the character wants something and where they get that disruption, there's often opposition, which can change their plan and force them to do new things and improvise, which can make it interesting. Steven, thank you so much for joining. Ghostface says, like, Breaking Bad would be a good example, I guess. Uh, Breaking Bad in terms of what? Oh, in terms of, like, the emotional response to different situations? Because if that's what you're saying, yes. I, I just love that show so much. The writing is just top-notch. And I haven't seen Camino Road yet, but I saw that just came up on Netflix, so... I have to watch that. Katie says, how do you keep the audience interested to continue reading when the story starts off as a quest or journey? It's like The Hobbit and The NeverEnding Story. Great question. So if you're going to do that, if it's a quest or journey, the thing that can make it super interesting is to make that quest or journey personalized to a character. This journey shouldn't just happen to anyone. It should happen specifically to a character who would never go on this journey. That's one option, for instance. Or to a character who has just this incredible desire for something. That This is in the 90s Disney movies where they have this I want situation and they desperately want something in their life but they just don't know what it is and they feel lost and there's this longing and they have this dream but they don't know what it is. And then the opportunity for the journey comes about. They're going to jump on that. So it could be, you know, those are the two big situations if you're going to personalize it to a character. But I'm, I'm really interested in those situations where a character wouldn't ever go on this journey. And so the question then becomes, how can you set up a situation where this, is, this journey is completely antithetical to what the character, how the character lives their life? Prime example of this is Breaking Bad, where you've got this chemistry high school teacher who lives his life in a very structured way. He doesn't take chances. He's missed out on opportunities. He's submissive. He just, he doesn't take life by the horns. He feels completely beaten down. What's the journey that he would never go on? Well, he would never start cooking meth to become a drug kingpin. And so for him to do that is insane. And the writers were just so brilliant in how they set up that situation to make it believable, understandable, and in a lot of ways we're like, yeah, I get it. Like, you only have a couple months to live and your family, you can't take care of your family. You need to do something now. Like, it's a, it makes sense. We empathize with Walter White. And I think that's one of the reasons why that show was so successful. So, yeah, a great question. Um, you can do other things initially. I, I had a post on the hook this morning, which is how to use different techniques to keep the audience's intention until you get that sort of call of adventure or call to adventure, which might be the beginning of the journey. Um, have a, you could create a mystery. Uh, you can also start from the antagonist perspective or the opponent's perspective. This is particularly powerful when you're doing a myth or an action. Um, let me check our time. Okay, we're doing great. We have 25 minutes. So our, a myth or an action where you start with the opponent first. If you'll notice, Star Wars actually does this, where a character, where Darth Vader leads the way. He's the one who's going after his primary desire, and the rebels are kind of just responding to that, trying to live. And Obi-Wan is, and Obi-Wan and Luke are responding to Leia's desire to get away from Darth Vader and to hide the plans, deliver the plans. So that can be a really effective way too, is first defining who's the opponent in this whole journey and how can they enact their plan from page one. And then 
that'll keep us interested to see how that goes through until uh, the character is called on their journey. So hopefully, Katie, that, that answers that question. Uh, Ghostface says it's worth it. Loved every second of El Camino. I'll definitely have to watch it because I'm a big fan of the series. Uh, Ryder Allen says, I read about parenthood. Awesome. How is that going? Uh, Courtney says, how would you dramatically keep them interested because you set the bar so high already in a story that starts off with a big quest? Uh, Katie says, that's true, Courtney. I agree. Uh, Courtney says, write like there are dramatic tools used to start it out high, but keep it high. Yeah, totally true. That's a great point. Um, Katie says, thanks for answering. Yeah, thanks for the great question. And yeah, Katie, or, uh, Courtney, there are so many great dramatic tools to start the bar high and create a hook and then keep it higher. One of the examples that I used this morning was speed, which I'm not sure if uh, you all have seen that recently, but it's Keanu Reeves and it starts with Keanu Reeves in his element. He's on a SWAT team and he's responding to this situation where a, an elevator is stuck and it's rigged with a bomb. And so he has to respond to that and rescue these hostages, essentially. Wow, we're starting off with a bang, right? But then, right after that's done, he gets another situation where now this bus is rigged with a bomb, and if it drops below, I think it's, once it goes above 55 miles an hour, the bomb is, is engaged or triggered, or uh, the timer set, rather. And if it goes below 55 miles an hour, the bus will explode. So. Wow, that's interesting too. But you'll notice in both of those scenarios, it's driven by the opponent's plan. So that's another thing to think about is what's your genre? Because if it's a mystery or a sci-fi, right? We're gonna want mystery around the technology and we're gonna want interesting technology that we're gonna see. But uh, in a mystery, we're gonna want some puzzles. That's gonna be really interesting. So I would think about what your genre is too. Katie, it sounds like if you're doing a sort of journey in the traditional sense, like the hero's journey, it would be more of myth, maybe some action. Uh, yeah, that's great. I hope that helps. And great point, Courtney, too, about the dramatic techniques. Frank says, the fly episode is one of my favorites, not because of action, but because I really wanted to see Walter and Jesse, if Walter and Jesse would kill it. A fly is a great example of dramatic tension. Um, yeah, so that, that's great. And it's a great point that Walter has a clear desire in that, in that episode. I wasn't a super big fan of that, but that's okay. It was sort of, it was the bottle episode, right? Where they, I think one of the reasons why I wasn't super engaged was because there weren't a lot of stakes. There was really nothing at stake if Walter didn't get the fly. Although... To your point also, there was a, the whole episode was subtext, right? It was Walter trying to deal with the, the situation he was in on an emotional standpoint. And that fly was symbolic of his greater situation. And like him being nitpicky over needing to control everything and things getting out of control from him. Uh, that's, yeah, that was an interesting thing there. Um, Courtney says they did the fly because they had no budget. Yeah, bottle episode. <laughs> but yeah, if, if they had somehow added some more stakes, but I get the situation with adding the subtext too. It was pretty cool. Uh, Elijah, thank you so much for joining. Ghostface says, can it be genreless? Yes, it can be. Uh, if it's going to be genreless, that's fine. You may want to think about what sort of genre, if any, you've promised to your readers or your audience, and that's done through marketing, like what's on the front cover. Uh, if it's genreless, we might think that it's it's most likely probably character driven then. And then you can create a lot of interest through character arcs and a character having an emptiness inside a void and providing problems and opportunities directly toward their void. That's kind of the techniques that you can use in that sort of a situation. So yeah, it can totally be genreless. Uh, if it's genreless, I would suspect it's character driven. So we want to look at a lot of our techniques in that area. Um, and thank you all for the great questions. These have been great. Courtney says, they, oh yeah, they did the fly because no budget, totally. Uh, that was a weird deviation of an episode. It was. Uh, Frank says, yeah, and when Jesse hits him, it's the best. Uh, Katie says, I have to go, but thanks again for answering. Bye everyone. Thank you, Katie. Thanks for being here. Have a great day. Ghostfer says, uh, okay, like fantasy. Um, I'm not, I don't remember what I said, but yes, <laughs> that's great. Okay, so we're discussing today how to write a scene. So I'm gonna continue with my checklist here. 
They have the thing to decide. So we've got our character who wants something, who, there are stakes, there's an opponent, there's urgency, they have a plan, They've, we've decided on their tactics. And uh, the next thing we wanna do is what's the medium through which they're going to enact their plan or their tactics. There are generally two ways to do this. It's either physical action or words. There's communication or there's sort of coercion, I guess you could say. Is the character going to force their plan upon somebody or are they going to use their words to manipulate or persuade or threaten? Uh, it's an important point that dialogue is a tool to get what a character wants. People speak because they want something. That can sometimes just be the desire for there not to be silence because they don't like an awkward situation, but that's a desire. So decide how, what the desire is behind it, a piece of dialogue. Ghostface says, thanks, uh, be back to hear the rest later. Thank you, thank you, thanks for being here. Space is the place, thanks for joining. Uh, Courtney says, genres, yes. I, yeah, genres are so interesting because there's so many different, I like to think of genres like archetypes for characters where they bring with them so many expectations. And that's great because the audience comes into it with expectations that we can then defy. We don't have to take our time setting up expectations because we know they already exist. And so that's a great way of taking advantage of the cliches of a genre, for instance. Uh, Animated Rock says, are there any good resources to learn how uh, to write good dialogue that is natural but still conveys the desires, still conveys the desire uh, or are manipulative? Um, I haven't read McKee's book, Dialogue, although I do have it, which I need to read next, I'm sure. But I assume that there's something good in there since it's like 300 pages all about dialogue. I gotta think he hopefully gave some good pieces of advice. So if anyone can, if anyone has read that and thinks that that would be good, please let me know. Um, John Truby has a section on dialogue in his book, The Anatomy of Story, which is pretty great. And then John York discusses dialogue from a more abstract perspective. But for dialogue, a lot of dialogue is subtext. And I've done a bunch of different posts about subtext. It's a lot of the times characters want something, but they're not willing to say what it is they want. They're not willing to just come out and say it. There can be a number of different reasons for this. One of those could be because there's this emotional, there are emotional stakes. Like, I don't wanna tell you how I feel because if it's not reciprocated, I will be crushed inside and our relationship will be super awkward from here on out. Those are emotional stakes. And so a character will tap dance around a situation or a secret and say that they love someone through their talk about the spaghetti rather than just coming out and saying it. But there can be other reasons too. If they know a character is most likely not going to do something, they may want to try to plant ideas. And so there's subtext there because they don't actually care about the thing they're saying. They're trying to look to deliver uh, manipulation or a deeper idea underneath that. Uh, of course, there are characters that don't have manipulation. Almost all of John Wayne's characters, uh, especially a lot of the cowboys in the Western genre, they just say whatever, whatever is on their mind because there are little to no emotional stakes in their situation and they rarely try to manipulate people. They mostly just use coercion if they're not using persuasion. They jump from either we're just gonna convince you to do it or we're gonna force you to do it. They rarely go into that deception mode, but that is a piece of the Western genre. So for, for the resources, yeah, you may wanna check out some of the past posts on subtext. If you go to kingo.com, K-I-I-N-G-O.com slash tag slash subtext, S-U-B-T-E-X-T, there are a bunch of different posts on that. So hopefully that could be helpful. And then McKee's book, I'll try to read it and uh, let you know if I, or I'm sure I'll pick up something helpful from it. So I'll let you know what it is. Karina says, so are there scenes that are imperative in a genre or more just beats? Nice. Like, does a genre have to have a series of turning points? Such a good question and such a big question, <laughs> such uh, an in-depth question. The short answer is there have to be beats and usually those beats are expressed as scenes. So Sean Coyne talks about the, in a thriller, for instance, he in his story grid 
paradigm or framework has tried to break down each of the genres and what are the, they're called obligatory scenes. They're the things that the audience expects to see within a scene, which is what you're alluding to right here. Where in a thriller, he says that we need to see the hero at the mercy of the villain. Uh, I think that might be in an action or a horror as well. We need to see a suspense scene where it looks like the hero is going to lose. In The Silence of the Lambs, this is where Clarice is in the dark with Buffalo Bill, and Buffalo Bill has the night vision goggles. She is at his mercy. He has the complete upper hand in the situation and can kill her. And crazy suspense in that scene. But Sean Coyne would argue that that is an obligatory scene of that genre. Now, there are obligatory scenes of other genres, of course, like in romance, we want the meet cute. How are the two characters going to meet in a way that is unusual and interesting and makes us realize immediately that they are most likely going to get together? Uh, there are a bunch of different ways for doing that. But then there are other... An obligatory scene, uh, additionally, can be thought of as an expected scene by the audience or the readers. And in a romance, too, we want to see uh, the, the lovers, like the breakup scene. And then we also want to see the chase at the end, where one of them goes and chases the other to get them back. That's an important part of what we want to see in a romance, or what's expected in romance, particularly romantic comedies. Now, the key part of this is that just because a scene is obligatory or expected, it doesn't mean it needs to be done in the cliche or traditional way. In other words, we know what must happen, but that doesn't mean we need to do it the way it's always traditionally been done. One of the key parts of making an interesting romantic comedy or an interesting romance is to have a meet cute scene that is unique, that it completely upends the cliches, that maybe plays into the cliches. Um, John Truby was talking about in Sleepless in Seattle, where in that, in that movie, Meg Ryan's character hears Tom Hanks over the radio and falls in love with his voice. And this does a couple of things. First of all, it's an interesting scene where the characters meet because it's through voice instead of in person. And then additionally, it shows us that Meg Ryan has fallen in love with Tom Hanks's soul, not just his face or his body or his demeanor. And so that's an interesting thing too, and a necessary part of a romance where the characters can see into each other's essence. And that also goes into genre convention. So short answer, Courtney, is that is just an amazing question that is so true that genres traditionally have imperative beats that traditionally show themselves as scenes. So great question, and that's like a whole conversation on going into the different genres and what's expected in each of those genres. Um, Kaylin, thank you for being here. Zappo, hello. Vilma, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it, everybody. If you have any questions about your story or writing in general, please leave it below. Uh, we are discussing today how to write a scene. Let's check our time. We've got 12 minutes, so if you want to sneak in any of those uh, questions, please do so. Okay, so we've just defined the plan and the medium through which they're going to enact their plan, which is going to be dialogue or physical action. Then we want to think about information. So what information is going to be delivered to who and when? And it might be information delivered to a character, but it might also be information delivered to the audience. So if there's been some secret that's been held throughout the story up to this point, maybe we're delivering the secret and unveiling it to a character. Or maybe if a character has been acting oddly for a while, maybe we reveal to the audience why they've been acting so oddly. And in that sense, the secret was kept from the audience. So secrets and misunderstandings are a whole conversation on their own, but they're an important part of sitcoms and information management in a story. And they're another way to create dramatic interest because it's a, de it's a desire to maintain a secret. And then it also creates subtext. So when a character wants something, but they have to be careful in how they're saying it because they don't want to give away a secret. Uh, that can be interesting. And then it's also just inherently interesting seeing two or more characters who are misunderstanding a situation. Frasier and 
uh, Friends, a lot of the traditional sitcoms are based almost entirely on secrets and misunderstandings. The, the entire episode is just somebody's got a secret and there's a misunderstanding about it and you can just write seasons and seasons and seasons on that. The Office was interesting because a lot of a lot of their interest is not necessarily based on that. Although in the latter half they did they did kind of go into that. So that's an interesting on the type of sitcom you can create too. But when we're writing a scene, when we're planning a scene, we need to decide what information needs to get across. What information do we need to get across to the audience and to each of the characters? We need to keep that in mind as we write the scene because that's the point of the scene. If we don't accomplish that, then the scene has failed its purpose and most likely in editing or revision, we'll need to scrap the scene or just be able to take it out. We can think of a story as a series of revelations or a series of delivering information. Uh, Courtney says, our Lord and Savior, Prison Mike. Prison Mike. God, it's so good. Um, I'm an office fanatic, yeah. Prison Mike and dramatizing, role-playing is great for creating dramatic interest. Just gags, huge in animation, but also in the office. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point too. Okay, now another thing that uh, Carson Reeves talks about in a scene that makes a, can make a scene so interesting is uh, a scene agitator. Okay, a scene agitator. This is a way to really boost your scene and give it just the extra oomph. So you've got your whole dramatic situation and you're playing it out and the characters are trying to get what they want and they've got this opposition. But how can we make that even more interesting than just urgency? We can add something that's just incredibly annoying. And you might think like, well, that seems like a bad idea. But no, it's not. If you add a car blaring, anytime you can add stress to a character that forces them to make mistakes, that forces them to have to think quickly, that forces them to be distracted, those are all things that are good to do. So how can we distract the character? How can we make them make mistakes? You could have a bug flying in their hair. You could have a crazy person screaming on the other side of the room. You could have someone who's violating their personal space. You could have someone who's screaming out a reminder that their time is almost over. You could have uh, all these different agitators, and that's the point, to agitate the characters. And then by proxy, we usually agitate the audience as well. But that's not necessarily a bad thing if they want to know what's going to happen. Just make sure that you're not agitating them throughout all of the scenes and that's where our sequels come in too but adding a scene agitator can really heighten a a scene to the next level because we want to uh, see it resolved sooner rather than later it creates an urgency in the audience to see this situation resolved so Carson Reeves talks about that in his book script shadow secrets definitely recommended Wesley thank you so much for being here today we're discussing how to write a scene um, Frank says, you could have a fly in your meth lab. Yes, you could, right? And especially if you're trying to do something else and the fly is agitating you or annoying you or disturbing you, then the fly almost starts to supersede your current desire to where you want to deal with the fly over whatever else you were doing. It's a great point. <laughs> so those are scene agitators and those are great. So another thing we have to decide when we're crafting a scene is the physicality of the scene. Where is it gonna take place? This is more important than we might initially think because we want our characters to enact or to interact rather with the setting. Two characters are having a battle in the middle of a church sermon is going to be very different than two characters who are having a battle in the middle of a junkyard. Those are two different situations that have different rules in the scene. If it comes to physical battle or coercion between them, they're also going to be using different objects in the scene. So we have to think about what are the objects that are available within the scene and what might they be using. Uh, Jim Mercurio in The Craft of Scene Writing, while we're talking about how to write a scene, I definitely recommend that book. The Craft of Scene Writing, he talks about how if you have a chef, for instance, who has a spatula, and the spatula has oil in it, and the chef's mad, and he's just complaining, and he's flicking the character with his spatula. Well, first of all, that adds agitation to the other character, but additionally, 
you know, that spatula becomes almost a weapon where the chef starts to realize, hey, he can just pick up some more grease, especially if the other guy's making him mad, and start intentionally flicking grease at the other person. But we don't get these fun gags or opportunities until we consider what's the environment of the scene and what, uh, what are the objects within the scene. Another important point that Matt Bird brings up in his book, uh, The Secrets of Story, is that we want to think about what are characters doing. Two characters sitting at a dinner table or sitting at the, you know, the kitchen table, that is generally fairly uninteresting. And the only thing you have pushing for the interest of the story is the words. Now, if it's a heavily emotional scene, maybe that can get you through because there's a lot of subtext and that can be interesting. But you can make it more interesting by having characters do something. Maybe one's digging a ditch, maybe another one's playing basketball, because then you can get the objects in the scene and have them start to get in the way or have the characters inadvertently use them as weapons or blocking uh, objects, things like that. Uh, but that's an important thing to do is think about what you're setting, what are the objects within your setting, how can characters use it? And then if you're thinking about the physicality of a scene, also think about blocking. How do the characters physically relate to each other? Jim Mercurio in his book, The Craft of Scene Writing, was also using, ex using an example from Good Will Hunting, where Sean and uh, Will are in a therapy session, and Will triggers Sean, makes him incredibly angry, I think talking about his, his deceased wife, and Sean takes off his glasses, puts them on the table, and like hurls himself to choke, uh, hurls himself toward Will to choke him. And that's, it's important to consider how are these characters relating in physical space. Uh, it's a, it's a important piece there. Courtney says, sorry I had to. Never apologize for prison, Mike. <laughs> that is always good. Uh, I may have read that before. Wesley says, can't stay for long. I'm editing a movie. Just came to say hi. Oh, thank you so much for dropping by. And good luck on the editing. I hope it's going well. Uh, Home and Story, thank you so much for joining. I think we only, have, we only have three minutes left. My goodness, this has flown by. You all have been fantastic. Um, let's see if I can get anything else in here. The final piece in writing a, a scene and crafting a scene is dialogue. What is the character going to say? And then what subtext is the character going to what is the subtext of the situation? Subtext comes about through context and what's on the character's mind versus how that contrasts with what the character is saying. When what a character is saying conflicts with what's on their mind, it creates subtext. Now, of course, the audience has to know what's on the character's mind, so we have to make sure that that's been expressed. The other thing we can do to make uh, dialogue interesting is to create irony. Irony is a huge subject, but it's generally where uh, it's a different situation where a character is saying something that's intentionally contradictory to what they intend to say. That's verbal irony. Uh, sometimes also thought of as sarcasm, although there can be minute differences in there uh, being facetious. So that's a great point too. And we've only got a minute and 58 remaining. My goodness. Uh, maybe it's Liam. Thank you so much for joining. So let's Let's review our craft of scene writing. First of all, def decide, do you need a scene? Is it a scene or a sequel? If so, if it's going to be a scene, def decide what the turning point is, what the disruption is going to be, what information you're going to deliver to the audience or to a character. Then decide who wants what. What are they going to lose if they don't get it? Or in other words, what's at stake? Who's the opponent? Who stands in opposition to the thing that they want? What's the urgency of the situation? Is there a scene agitator? Is there something that's going to disturb them across uh, the scene or disrupt what they're doing? Uh, is it a chase scene or an escape scene? Are they trying to get something or are they trying to avoid something? Uh, what's the narrative drive? Is it driven by dramatic tension or dramatic irony or promises or something else? There are a bunch of other tools as well. Can you make the desire hard to want to, want to do? That makes it compelling conflict. What's their motivation? What's the fundamental relationship between the characters in the scene? What's the strategy and tactics that the character is going to use? Is it going to be uh, persuasion, manipulation, deception, or coercion? Uh, what's the medium through which they're going to enact those tactics? Is it dialogue or physical action? Uh, are there any secrets or misunderstandings? What's the physicality of the scene? Uh, what's the setting? What are the objects? How do the characters physically relate to each other in terms of blocking? Uh, and then dialogue. What's the subtext? What's on the character's mind? And is there any irony? 
And then most of all, in any scene, what's the turning point? What's the thing that changes the story and moves things in a different direction? Turning points turn a story in a new direction. That's the key. Okay, thank you so much for being here, everybody. What's this? Editing film is about exactly the same as editing a screenplay. Nice. Yeah, it's all editing a story, right? That's great. Thank you all so much for being here. I'll see you next week.